Hello, Spark fans. Welcome back to Advancing Spark, brought to you by Advancing Analytics, your favorite data and AI consultancy. It is 2025, and I'm going to do a video about stored procedures. <laughs> that makes me sad, but it is where we're at. So, recently, Databricks brought out SQL stored procedures available within Databricks, and that's kind of cool, but also kind of taking so many steps backward, it makes me sad, but there's a big reason for it. So, if you've not seen it before, essentially, store procs are essentially declared linguistic steps you can do programmatic steps in SQL. So you can kind of force SQL to act a little bit like a programming language. So you can say, well, insert some data there and then select something from there, put it in a variable, write it into there. You can build out repeatable steps and then you call the procedure and it calls those steps. A little bit like just writing a function. Don't get it confused with user-defined functions, which tend to be a, I want to call this to give me a result inside of a query. This is a higher up. This is saying run this statement, this statement, this statement. So it's a bit of a higher level. Now, I get it in PySpark, it's slightly confusing because we'll build a function that will take a data frame and apply some transformation steps, write the data frame out, and then give you your data frame back. That's kind of the same as what a SQL store proc is trying to do. So think about it like that. Don't think about like something you call within a select statement. It's something that calls select statements. Now, for years, people used it as a way to build repeatable um, ETL steps. So you will have data warehouses built entirely out of stored procs. And people go, yeah, that's my warehouse. And they'll just run a load of stored procs in order. And then we got better. And we started using, you know, slightly more software engineering. The whole data engineering thing came about. And we've not looked back and run a st stored proc for years. Years and years and years. Now, I get it, right? There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies who have a massive legacy SQL-based warehouse where all of their logic sits there in stored procs. And to say they're going, well, you're not allowed to use Databricks until you've rewritten all of your logic in PySpark or ETL, whatever you lake flow, whatever you happen to be doing. Well, that's not great. That means people are, there's a barrier, there's an investment cost before people can start using the platform. So from Databricks point, I completely get it. This just means that people can go, oh, well, my stored procs is over there. I change a little bit of syntax and then the exact same thing runs in Databricks and I don't have to re-architect my entire platform. Cool. Lowers the barrier, makes it super easy for people to come on. It makes sense. It still makes me sad. I haven't had to write a stored proc for a decade and it made me happy, but this is where we are. So if you've never seen a stored proc, you don't know what this is. You want to see how it works. You, you're currently using stored procs, but not in Databricks. I'm going to quickly show you how it works, how it fits together, the kind of things you can do inside the new store procs inside Databricks. Do I suggest you go and build your entire warehouse from scratch on it? No. But can you port a warehouse over? Sure, if you have to. That's where we're at. As always, if it's your first time around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. And then, yeah, let's go have a look. So first things first, I've got some docs. Uh, we've got the big announcement that came out a couple of weeks ago. A bunch of things you can see in here. Essentially, if you've seen a store proc before, there's nothing crazy. So create a replace procedure. Fine. Give it a name. Cool. Um, you always have parameters. Now, in this flavor, you've got input and output parameters. So I can say, well, this is an in parameter. So in x, integer, etc. Uh, I can say this is an out parameter, which case I'm not expecting all my users to put it out, but they can define it as a variable so I can grab it. Or you can have an in out so something like put in that's going to be mutated as part of whatever's inside that logic and it's going to feed back a different value to me. Cool. Useful things. There's then some of these weird bits about setting the security context and who it runs as. And there's some, there is some nuance. There's some settings around is it determin deterministic or not? Uh, so we can go and have a play with some of those settings. But then the majority of the familiar stuff is there's a SQL begin, a SQL end, and then a bunch of logic that is ran inside of it. And you can break this up into other programmatic loops. You can have to-dos and pointers and do a little bit of programming inside there. Majority of the time you want to avoid that, but depends what you're trying to do. A load of other stuff going on. You can call it, you can describe it. It lives like a function object inside Unity Catalog. So if you've registered SQL functions before, it looks exactly the same, except it's a Store proc, not a scale or type of your fun uh, function. So, yeah, you can do some funky things. We can have some inserts. We can then have a separate insert. You can be writing into several different places, all inside a single store proc. 
You can even call multiple stored procs from one stored proc. So you can have a master stored procedure and then call a set of child substitutes, uh, sub, sub procedures from within it. Again, this is a thing of archaic old SQL design. I don't recommend doing that, but you can, should you wish to. Don't let me be the boss of you, but it just makes me sad. So with that little bit of background uh, in, let's just go and have a look at building one. So yeah, let's see. We've got, I've got a couple of little quick things I'm going to try. So first things first, I've got a little SQL statement to give me a random number. It's not going to be a random number because I've hard coded the seed. It's going to give me the same random number each time I run it. Great. Thanks. Lovely. So that's, that's all right. But if I wanted to actually make that usable, I can start wrapping it in a function. If I, if I assumed my users wouldn't know that and I, they, I, they just wanted to give it a number and give something back. Essentially, there's no point in this because we're essentially just rebuilding the RAND function, but as an example of how we'd build it. So we need to start with like the basic scaffolding of that. So we need to say, well, create or replace uh, my procedure. I'm going to call it rando is the name of my random um, number generator. I'm saying I want an input, which is going to be my seed. So instead of passing hard coding that 10, I want the user to be able to just pass in the number it's going to use as that seed. And it's going to give me a decimal out. This is literally just recreating a random function. Um, we then got those little bits of like security and settings, little tags, just so it kind of knows how to run. So yes, it's going to be SQL language. I don't know if there's going to be other languages aside from SQL, but sure. Uh, the SQL security invoker is who it's running as and giving it the ability to actually run as the user calling the stored proc, not as me, the person creating it. And it's non-deterministic. In this case, I'm using a RAND function. It's going to give it. Well, is it deterministic? I'm giving it a seed. Eh, you could argue. Um, and then, yeah, we actually need our function. So as I got my begin, got my end, and even whatever logic needs to sit in the middle, which is just going to be this rand function. I actually want to set that p randy um, variable back up back of it. So I can say set my p randy equals uh, my rand. And I get my seed times hundred. Nice, straightforward. So that is going to go and create a new function. So that's going off and creating it wherever I happen to be doing this. Again, normal Unity catalog stuff, three bar naming. Uh, in this case, main.function library. It's just going to have a new function called rando created in it. So I can go and create that. Say so go create my thing. Uh, and I've done it wrong. What am I missing in that function? Oh, I'm missing a terminator at the end of my logic. There we go. Okay. So that's, that's now set. So I can now go and actually use that. I can call that function back. I can kind of use it to set another variable. So let me actually just go in my code, go and use that. So I'm declaring another function called Randy. I'm choosing it multiple times, it's fine. And then calling uh, my other function. And I'm saying I want to bring that Randy back and see if that actually works. That should work. Give me an error. There we go. So passing in that different seed value that's going in as P seed being passed into this random seed function, then setting prandy inside my uh, store proc, and it's giving me back as a new thing. So I can give it a different seed value, run that again, and go and actually get it. Now, I could be doing something where it goes and it generates a seed value, and it's calling a different random function to generate a seed and then passing that in. I could be inserting that into five different places inside my logic. Again, as much as you want to happen inside here, it's kind of fair game. That's kind of the point. But... That simple example of creating this function, a re recallable SQL function that is doing higher level clause level statements going off and calling things. So if I go and dive into, I guess if we dive into the catalog, we can have a look in main, we can have a look in retail, not retail, didn't do it in retail, did it in my function library. You can see rando has been created. So I've got my, my new function living here. I can go have a look at it. I can see it's got the logic set against it. I can see the parameters that it's passing in and out. I can see how it's working. I can see the security. That is now a managed part of my catalog. Inside my Unity catalog, I've got that whole thing is just going to be in there. I can go and have a look in my function library. I've got my lovely function knocking around nowhere. There we go. So again, you can build up a library of these reusable blocks of code. I mean, the other thing I wanted to show you was the building it out and just saying, oh, can we be a little bit more complex? Can we do something a bit fancier? So I guess kind of more the ETL style thing that we see people using it for is 
I want to insert data repeatedly into a table. Can I use this? So in this case, I'm going to create this table. So again, in my function library, probably shouldn't create it in my function library, but eh, whatever. I'm creating a table called destination. It's got an identity column and it's got a little, a little value. So I can say well, what's in there and I'm going to have nothing. So I've just created it. Great. Uh, and then I want to be able to like start inserting data into it, right? I want to just be able to go, well, just ins insert some data into my table. So if I was doing that from scratch, I'd have something like that. So I need to give it a variable. I don't want it to pass it to the ID and the value column. I'm just inserting into that value column. So I'm going to let it generate its identity, but I'm trying to give it a number. So again, I can just wrap all of that inside a procedure. I, I, I don't need to run that a single bit of code each time. So let me just go and recreate all of that. So I've got my interdestination, indodest, terrible names. Uh, it's taking a parameter called pnum. So I'm just going to pass the number I want. It's going to take that. It's going to slap that into my table. So that as a procedure, it's just a, basically an insert statement that I've wrapped. So people don't need to, need to know how, it, how to do it. All they need to do is call that. They call my store proc. That's in a number. I say in at 10. If I call that, that should. All things go well. Insert a single row into my table called destination. Okay, it's successfully executed. So I can select star from destination, go see what's happening inside there. And I should see one record with its first identity column. Okay, let's do it again. And call that proc again. Goes off, inserts the next row. I've got no duplicate detection. I could put that inside my proc if I wanted to. And now I've got two rows of 10. Identities one and two. Nothing rocket science there. Really straightforward, repeatable, wrapped bits of code. Now, the interesting bit is when people try and use it for that kind of orchestration kind of thing. So if I wanted to uh, go and build this out, so on a, a new procedure, and I can build something that's like a wrapper around it. I want to build a procedure that calls this three, four times and just goes back to that into, into dest function and just calls it repeatedly. So this is going to be my wrapper. This is going to be my uh, wrapper, the wrapper. Uh, and that's just going to, I'm not going to take any numbers. That's it. It's just a function. Uh, I need to do my same setting stuff. So I'm going to actually make sure it's got those bits. And I've got my, my usual proc wrappings. Uh, and then inside it, I can just call that logic. And that logic is the same logic we had a second ago of just calling this procedure. So I can go, well, okay. I'll call that procedure. And I want to call it with value one. And then I want to call it with value two, three, four, etc. And that's that's where it starts to get powerful, right? You, you don't just have to have a single SQL select statement, a single SQL uh, execution inside there. You can have multiple different bits of SQL that are executed, doing different things, selecting from something, writing to something, merging somewhere, uh, and then actually have that as something you can go and call and recall. There we go. So I've created that procedure. I can then go and call wrapper the wrapper. Have that run. So that should go. I should now, if I go and have a look what's inside my destination table again, I should see I've got my two original test rows and then I've got four insertions of one, two, three, four. So I can go do select star. Oh, that's not helping me out this time. There we go. To go and see what's inside that table. There we go. So my store proc successfully called another child store proc four times. And I can run it again. It'll go off and do it. Now, there's loads of good design rules. You want to make sure your store procs are deterministic. Uh, well, no, no, they need to be item potent. Uh, you need to make sure you can actually run it repeatedly. You can test them. You can do that kind of stuff. Realistically, don't do masses of ETL logic here. It's not the best place for it. This is giving you functionality so you can migrate masses of code from elsewhere outside of Databricks and bring it into this environment. But you're carrying tech debt that you can then go and pick up and tidy up and put somewhere nicer. Now, you know, if we take all of this stuff and then we compare it to uh, Spark declarative pipelines, where you can do a similar thing, you can write insert statements, you can have all your SQL logic, but it wraps it in an ETL framework that has dependency management and restartability and logging and all the good stuff that is a far better place to build out your ETL logic. So this is a great place to get your code and your logic into Databricks. And I just really don't want to see a world where people go, I've got a beautiful blank canvas 
I'm going to build things the way we built it 10 years ago. That doesn't seem like a smart thing to do. But now you can. You know, you can you can do whatever you want. The world is your own oyster. If you want to go and build a load of store procs, be my guest. Don't ask me to fix it when it's a horrible spaghetti mess of interdependent code that you can't trace. But still, it'll be fine. Cool. That is it. That's all I wanted to run through, just at a very high level, giving you a little bit of a flavor going, well, store procs are in, now in there. If, it, if you've ever heard someone go, yeah, you can't do store procs in Spark, that used to be true. It's no longer true. So the door is open. You can bring them all into Databricks. Just, just tidy them up afterwards. Just pick the bits out that are masses of boilerplate repeated code and go, oh, we could tidy this up with a bit of pie spark. But you do you. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out the docs for uh, store procs. There's a little bit of syntactical nuance in there that you'll need to get used to. But yeah, otherwise, have fun. Cheers.